you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, this uh, show really belongs to Dr. Asisha. He is on the way. He should be here. So before we finish our talk, he will be probably with us. Asi, as you are aware, is also from Bombay and is uh, done pioneering research work on intraocular lenses. So you will find something very interesting. Uh, R.C. caught me and told me that you talk to, talk to uh, the group of people on basics. And I said, if I start talking on basics, I said, I know what I will see here. A pile of empty chairs and everyone will walk out. So as he turned around and said, he said, you make it interesting enough so they don't. Which I would like to do to the best. Now, what I am going to try and bring up to you is not just to tell you what PMA material and blah, 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 is, which really is quite boring. I am going to try and bring up to you how you can utilize the materials to your maximum advantage and how you can gain from the knowledge which has been made. Also, how you can utilize these systems and how you can decide a lens, its design on how you can prevent posterior capsular opacification, which is one of the big bugbears that we have, especially now that we started doing multifocal lenses with the regular routine. Now, the whole idea behind choosing a material for cataract surgery is very simple. It should result in two things. You should have post-operative information. So the last thing you want is a patient sitting on your chair and creeping away to Rui, Nadania. You should have a good track record. And most important of all, and I stress over and over again, which is what I'm going to stress in my lecture, posterior capsule or opacification is something you have to handle. The earliest materials were made of polymethyl methyl. Basically, it was next. You are all aware of Harold, however, about Harold Ridley, who noticed that uh, the material was there in a Spitfire pilot's eyes and therefore started utilizing the same material. With the introduction of FICO, the materials have changed, which we are now going to look into. Therefore, now materials can be divided essentially into two basic categories hard and foldable. In the heart, you have non-foldable is the hydrophilic uh, acrylic lenses and you have the foldable category which is foldable, hydrophobic, hydrophobic silicone, hydrophobic acrylate and four polymers, combinations of the two of them. We have now started getting, uh, for example, the Zeiss lens is made of silicone and has a coating of hydrophobic acrylate on top. There are various materials. We won't go into the chemical analysis, but I just put up this one little slide to show you that basically there are a lot of similarities in the lenses. Look at the PMMA and the sensor. Sensor essentially utilizes BGDA material, which is a softener onto PMMA. While the acrylic softener, if you compare silicone, both have got, as you notice, the loop structures are fairly similar to each other. So a lot of these lenses borrow from one and the other to make a new material. When you talk of polymethyl methacrylate, even though it played a great role and still plays a role because we can utilize it as a polymer manual expression of surgery, its sharp edges led to low PMM rates. And that was one of the initial points which was brought up. We originally thought, and this was brought up when Acrisoft first came out, and everybody said, Acrisoft, ah, it's a material which is cast down on the edge of posterior capsule of it wasn't the material. It wasn't the adhesiveness of the material. It was essentially nothing much more than the edges. And that's what I'm going to show you as time goes down the line. <coughs> then came the foldable hydrophobic materials, not filic. Filic was the first material which we handled for many, many years ago. Filic has a very big advantage that you can utilize it if there's silicone inside the eye. Silicone does not adhere onto a filic lens, it adheres onto a phobic lens. It adheres especially onto a silicone lens. Now, the whole method, whole concept behind the hydrophobic was not from your point and my point of view, so much as from the point of the laboratories. Why? Because the errors which can occur in a filic lens amplify by a factor of three because the material hydrates up to three times. Normally, the 33% hydration. But the phobic lens takes only 1.2 to 2%. So as they can give you a lens with a higher level of accuracy, which is one of the reasons why companies have gone on to the hydrophobic materials. But hydrophobic materials have problems with what is known as glistenings. Something you have heard about so often, I'm going to talk to you a little about it. So you are a little more aware of these things. Silicone was a great material. 
It was one of the first foldable materials which came across. Uh, way back, if I remember right, way back in 1990, we started putting these lenses. Unfortunately, the level of expertise in doing small incision cataract surgery had not developed. We had to open it up and put in a plate and big lens. We had not learned how to do our access. And a lot of these lenses did what is known as a swan dive. You know what is a swan dive? It makes a straight dive inside the vitreous. We injected it, go straight. And this is one of the reasons why silicon developed a bad name to be. It's not a bad name, it's a good lens. As a matter of fact, at present, as I said, Zyze is a silicon lens. It's only got a coating on the surface. Interestingly enough, the question is why did Zyze coat it if it is a good lens? That is because if you have to sell it in the European market, it has to have a hydrophobic coating. Zyze is being clever, took the silicon lens and coated it. So a Zyze lens is nothing more than a silicon lens with a hydrophobic coating. Now, big advantage of silicon lenses is yeah, they are very resistant to injector forces, etc. Zeiss lenses don't tear because they are silicon lenses. Uh, lenses made by HEMA when you inject it, very often one leg will be left outside. So if you are in a difficult case, try and select a lens which is uh, based on either silicon or a phobic because those lenses are tougher and they don't break. When we go into the foldable hydrophilic aggregate layer, one of the big problems noticed was glare. In the early days, when you fit an actress up lens and the patient walked into the room, the relatives could see a light glinting in the eye. Those Dr. Rasi Shahadara, I already introduced him over here. And one of the uh, one of the uh, problems used to be the patient used to say that my relative, you can make out the glint in her eye. Some of who, some of us who are a little more uh, expert in uh, answering these sort of questions would turn around and tell the patient, if you see the glint, then you should be happy because it shows the lens is well centered. And we should tell them every morning, thoughts say they go, glint, they get out of the The funny thing about life is, if you convert an unfortunateness to a fortunate concept, life becomes good. To give you an example, retrobulbar injection. When you give a retrobulbar injection, it hurts. You tell the patient, when I give the injection, it feels warm inside the eye. It means the injection is the Patient tells you, ah, that's a bad, that's a bad thing. So you have converted something which is unhappy into a happy one. It's only a method of putting it, it's only words. But it converts an unhappy patient, says, after the bad idea, to a person who says, ah, no, what's the thing to give an injection? But that's beside the point. So this is one of the problems which occurred because of this reflection of glint on the surface of the eye, what we call as this photopsia, tended to occur. Another typical problem with access of lenses is in some of the patients, they have a band of light reflecting at the side, which is nothing much more than internal reflection light from the edge. Why is this important? Because now, now when you look at a lens and you examine the lens, you have to be sure that the edge is not a sharp cut edge. A sharp cut edge will stop PCO. A sharp cut edge will cause you a lot of glare, so the patient will be unhappy. If it is a, a tricky patient, kitsch kitsch patient, don't put sharp edge lenses. A lot of talk has gone into doing PCO and making the edges in a manner in which the growth of the cells does not occur. What we call as a lens epithelial cells do not grow below the lens. One of the easy ways of doing it was press on the posterior capsule. So we got lenses with angulations. First they came up with 5 degrees and one company said, ah, is good, 10 is better. So they got 10 degree angulation. Big disadvantage of angulations was they caused pressure in the lens. Number one. Number two, if there is the slightest weakness in the capsule, your lenses would break. Number three, when you did a yak, your posterior capsule of part would get captured, leading to complications and changes in power. If you look at this picture, in which the both eyes of the same patient three years after surgery, one piece acris of one piece acris of lens, lens epithelial cells as you notice it. And that is a multi-piece with which you, which you see very little in growth in a similar location. The multi-piece lenses, despite what has been said, have an advantage and let me show you why. Now in between came about what we call as light filtering concepts, where we use ultraviolet light and blue light. I'm going to talk to you a little about it a little later, depending on how much time I have at my convenience and available to me. And uh, then we will proceed from that point onwards. But essentially, do remember that as far as we are concerned, 
Till date, no study has shown that the yellow loss in lens causes a loss in color contrast values, despite what everybody said. But equally, no study has really shown that it can be used. So, yellow lenses are shown to be protective. There are supposed to be this word, uh, number of drawbacks. I'm going to talk to you for a few seconds on that. Because I personally am not very fond of yellow lenses. Uh, yellow lenses became very popular. I remember Malio, Malio again, which is the, uh, the the top surgeon in Russia and in, in, in Moscow, when standing up at the European meetings, was asked, what is your opinion regarding yellow lenses? And he said, we have put in more than 50,000 lenses in Russia. We have stopped using them because they don't work. But that was his personal view. When we go into intraocular lens design, Lenses are essentially multi-piece, monoblock, plate, open haptic, angulated, planar haptics. Leave aside all that. What we are interested in is how does the lens work as far as you and I are concerned. And with that particular lens, what problems am I going to have? And that is what we are essentially going to talk about. Now there are various lenses. If you see on top, they are open loop lenses. The bottom, what we call is monoblock. And essentially, they are closed loop lenses. Rainer, on the other hand, is a, a monogamy, or, or should I call it a bigamy, of two procedures whereby open and closed are locked together. And, uh, oh, thank you. Oh, all right, all right, all right. They have been kind to me. They said you can go slower. I said thank you. And the bottom one which you see are angle supported lenses. Why are each of these important? What I want you to know. Most important, I can only show you one place. When you see these type of lenses, these lenses are essentially 13.5 millimeter in length. The capsular bag of the human eye is 10.5 millimeter. If you take the capsular bag and out, put it between two sheets of paper, press it and map it. That is 10.5. So why are we having 13.5? The idea being that it increases the curve of contact and thereby stabilizes the lens. So these lenses, when you put it in the eye, you will get a little line running across, which tells you that uh, this is how the tension rings are occurring. This is what the line is. Very often the, the cells, which lens epithelial cells, tend to grow along the line. So very often you will see thickening occurring as the two polar plates running downwards. The monoblock lenses, which you see at the bottom, essentially are the same pattern along which uh, the eyes essentially are based are lenses which unfortunately are, are a quasi lens. They use the edge of the optic to prevent the RLs to go in. And RL means uh, the lens which run below the lens, the refractive material lens. So, and we are not too worried about it. When we talk of the plate haptic designers, that, that those with the plate haptic four corners give better capsular loop hold. However, this lens can only be used in what is known as a good situation. You cannot utilize this lens if your bag is not perfectly rounded. You cannot utilize this lens if there is any weakness in the capsular bag because the moment you insert that the lens, you will have a lens. So, so when you are, the rule now is that if you have a plate haptic lens, you have to have a standby lens with a loop optic. Just remember. One of the big disadvantages is because there is no band on top and bottom, the LECs, which are basically the lens epithelial cells, which are called LECs in future, are migrated along the posterior capsule. So, so some of these people use the crossover between the two lines, as you noticed on the curve here, and use a combination of the two to use the haptic loops to block the LECs and use the optic to run it down. Be that what it may. The one piece, one as I mentioned a little earlier, has problems. Problems always that the contracting forces of the capsular bag will cause a slippage. Now, you are always bombarded with statements from manufacturers all over that see the lens compresses so easily. It compresses provided there is no fibrosis in the bag. If there is fibrosis in the bag, the compression is irregular and is based on the line of fibrosis. Invariably, when you have lenses with loops on top and bottom, over a period of time, decentrage is common. 
So irrespective of what people will turn on and tell you, open loop lenses do tend to decenter. On the other hand, closed loop lenses don't. So that is one benefit which you have in your in your armament area. When you have J loops, as I mentioned earlier, 13.5 diameter, it forms stress force. You now the interesting thing about the capsule is it tends to compensate itself. And with the result that though a stress hold will develop for the first two three months, so over a period of time it will go down. But the place to look for it is along the stress force. Another very important thing to remember is if you have put this lens in a young patient, never do yak capsulotomy along the lines of the stress hold because the capsule will tear. Always do it at the right angles. So just remember when you utilize this lens to do your yak as you're running in that way. Signalized lenses I won't talk to you much about and haptic angulation I'm going to talk to you with a few pictures. When we talk of haptic angulation, haptic is the legs because of haptics. And the optic, optic and legs, two legs and all essentially. Where there are no legs and the carrier part of the zone we call it a haptic. Now as you notice over here, this is a carrier zone and here you notice along the edges here are where your pressure zones will start developing. To prevent growth along these lines, what they now do is they bend these zones in a manner which you see over here, so the loop gets thicker in that zone. You see, if you see a Rayner lens, it is very thick at the edge. On the other hand, you see some of the other lenses uh, who are Rayner pattern copies, I would call it that way. They don't have that thickness in the edge and they do not have the same properties. So whenever you examine the lens, look for this edge because that is what will protect you. Over a length of time, oversizing is something which we do not need to use. Oversizing originally was put as a 13.5-14 millimeter lens because very often if we didn't have a bag you push it in the sunglass and it sat within the sunglass. Nowadays we very rarely do pretty good bags. I think everybody does great bags now. Huh? With the result that uh, oversized lenses are not really required. On the other hand, if you are going to do a cataract in a case where you feel that you may not get a good access, hypermature cataract, adhesion on the surface, fibrosis, strands on the surface, remember to take a loop lens so that you can manage to get adequate support. I won't go into this and I'm going to now go into a little more illustrations. Now, haptics, the legs, allow a three-point fixation if you utilize a decentered haptic. So when you have lenses in which the optic is decentered off, it causes compression of the posterior capsule, preventing the growth of these cells, while mono cell, mono lenses will not cause it. In a similar manner, a traditional eye will get growth of cells, a regular new part ion will not. When you look at the edge design of the lens, it is very important that the edge design be such that it prevents growth going. Unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, a square edge causes tremendous reflection. In an effort to get rid of that, they started blending the lenses. When they blended the lenses, the cells started growing backwards, so they now have a sharp back edge and a rounded front edge, a combination of the two. But that is essentially what is being used over a period of time. In a similar manner, they started, as I mentioned, you blend the front edge so that this problem tends to go down. Uh, this is the AO, AO lens, but that's not the point. The important point is the way they have done the blending, which helps us into the edge. In a similar manner, geometry of, and by complexity, something that Dr. Ramesha is going to be covering, I won't dwell into this, but it does alter it quite radically. Taking some of the lenses, Though this is an open loop design, it is termed as a close because the loop takes it. These lenses, this sort of a pattern which we call the Rita Brenner pattern is made by various manufacturers, gets into the bag very easily, so supports itself well, doesn't slip on. So good lens will not give you trouble. On the other hand, the loop lenses, as you notice here, as I told you, depending on where the fibrosis will occur, the lens will descend. This does not tend to occur too much in the monoblock lenses and which is the reason why I normally recommend use monoblock lenses. So we have five minutes. Okay. Uh, two spherical systems, as I said, there are toric lenses, which you will also notice. Notice the little uh, marks at the side. And these are, the toric lenses should not rotate. So we have always made purposely much bigger in size. And when you look at the clinical performance, one of the big problems is with glistening, 
Brother Ned has become a socially opaque, as you see. And uh, I'll just quickly read the letter across and go on to glistening, which I think is something which you will enjoy. Now these are the cells. As you notice, the cells, two weeks, four weeks, they tend to grow up. And this regeneration occurs along the line of the traction which we have put. So when you have to yarn is never along this line because your lens, your lens capsule will be When you talk about glistenings, which you talk on almost all the lenses, glistening are nothing much more than micro vacuoles. And uh, they occur in the surface of the lens and they occur purely because of changes in refractive material between the IO and the material. See the little lines coming across in the middle of the lens here. And these glistenings are what cut down the quality of vision which you get. And this change in temperature is probably taken to be the most important cause for all the glistenings. And it occurs because the lens has not been cured properly. Nowadays they have started curing the lenses a little better. So these sort of glistenings are not seen too often. And some of the older day lenses develop glistening almost on the complete optic of the lens and literally develop a cataract by themselves. Uh, this is just a small little brief analysis before we start off on the main topic. But just remember, look at your lens, study your lens and study your patient. You should be able to tailor the lens and the patient together so that PCO should be a thing of the past. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much.